So welcome everybody. This is, um, I have no idea what number webinar this is that we've done so far this year, um, but it's one that we're really excited about. So we've titled this one, The Lowly Sparrow. Um, but just kind of to talk about how cool this group of birds is that many people don't necessarily always think that much about. Um, but to introduce the webinar, and just in case you're new, um, we have a few technical things I want to go over. So if you tap or click your screen or move your mouse, you should have three buttons. You should have a Q&A button. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, we'll kind of wait till the end to take to answer questions. But if you have a question and you're afraid you'll forget it, you can go ahead and pop it in there and we'll address it at the end. Um, you'll also have a raise hand function. So if maybe if you're having um, technical issues or if we're like, hey, does anybody know what this bird is? You can go ahead and it'll be like you're raising your hand um, that you know. Um, and there's also a chat function. So if you have any comments or anything that you would like to share, um, we'll try to keep that to a minimum during the actual webinar just so it's less distracting for people. Um, but if you have questions, please put them in that Q&A box just because it's easier for us to monitor and make sure we get to all of them if they're in the Q&A. Um, but to get started, so we're the Missouri River Bird Observatory and that's our mission right there. And essentially we work to help birds. Um, and today, uh, who's gonna be talking to you is me. So I'm Paige Wittick, I'm the education coordinator with the organization. Um, and Dana Ripper and Ethan Duke, the directors and co-founders of the organizations are also gonna be talking to you today about sparrows. So our work, we work towards a few different things. Well, I don't wanna say a few, we work towards a lot to help these birds. So we work towards providing quality habitats. Um, feeding the flock refers to sustainable agriculture. We also work to provide bird friendly communities. So that's like preventing window strikes and things like that. And we work to get people out in nature. Um, if you want to learn more about what any of those entails, you can visit our website, mrbo.org, and there, there's more information about each of those and our core values as well. So what we're talking about today. So our kind of theme of this presentation is that sparrows are more than they appear at first glance. So a lot of people, when they first look at a sparrow, they think, oh, tiny brown bird. But when you look closely, especially at our native species, they, you can see a variety of different colors and they have such cool facts about them. And Ethan's gonna go over how even a simple sound can be more complex than you originally thought. Um, so um, Dana's, or to kind of outline it, um, Dana's gonna talk, I'm gonna go back a little bit first. So to kind of outline it, Dana's gonna go over some of the different sparrows that you can find here in Missouri and Ethan will go over some of those chip notes. So when people think sparrow, um, I think a majority of people, especially non-bird people, which I'm guessing many of you are bird people, um, they think about this bird. And this, these two pictures are actually the same species of bird. This is the house sparrow which is actually a non-native species of bird um, called invasive as well, um, that Dana will talk about a little bit more about why they came here. Um, but the top picture is the male and the bottom picture is the female. And so a lot of people think, and they're kind of drab, but even these guys, when you look at them closer, have very kind of intricate patterning to them. Um, but these aren't the only sparrows that exist. They're definitely numerous, so I see why people think that. You find them almost everywhere. Um, but there are all these different kinds of species of sparrows here in Missouri and elsewhere. And some of them are more common and easy to find than others. But if you really take a look at them, they have such unique colors. And so we really just want to emphasize to you guys that sparrows are more than they appear at first sight. And they're really, really cool once you get to know them and very cute as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dana, who's going to talk to you guys a little bit more about each of the sparrows that you can find. So I'm going to stop my screen share and go ahead, Dana. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think Paige's summary was really, really good. So I've been really excited about this webinar and I want to give a shout out to Kathy Borgman, um, our friend and MRBO supporter from Arrow Rock. 
um, that asked about us having a webinar on sparrows and even actually suggested the title of the lowly sparrow because they are thought of as sort of drab. Um, you know, a lot of folks consider them not very interesting birds, um, but as Paige shared a little bit, we have a variety of species of sparrow here in Missouri, and I've been most excited about this particular webinar because we don't have any bad news for you. We don't have any things that we are suggesting you do. Um, it's not even really, at least my part, isn't entirely about identification either. Um, essentially, I'm just going to show you pictures of beautiful birds. So I'm going to go ahead and get my screen sharing started here. I think. Okay, so Paige mentioned that the house sparrow, um, which you can see here, another picture of a male and female, um, that they are not native to North America. Um, they're actually, their full name is the English house sparrow, Passer domesticus, um, because they're a bird that lives really, really well around humans. So that's Mr. William Shakespeare there at the top. Um, there has been a widely circulated story in Berkshire and ornithology circles that I have heard for many years now, and that is that a group of folks set out to release in New York City um, in the 1800s every species that was mentioned in any of Shakespeare's works. And as I did the research for this particular webinar, actually, I found out that that was a little bit of a of a skewed version of the real history. Um, but there was indeed a gentleman named Eugene Schifflin in New York City. Um, and he was both a member of the local Shakespeare Society. So he was in fact a lover of Shakespeare's work. But he also helped found something called the American Acclimatization Society. And that society's mission was to introduce to the new world foreign varieties of the animal and vegetable kingdoms as maybe useful or interesting. So hindsight's 2020, right? So by the late 1800s, um, agencies such as the newly formed, you know, United States Department of Agriculture were like, hey, that was a really, really bad idea. Um, but Mr. Shefflin was one of a few people that introduced the English house sparrow in the early 1850s. And in that case, they were doing it to try and control the linden moth, um, the larvae of which were apparently uh, being very harmful to trees in New York City. So the most famous story about that gentleman, though, is his release of um, European starlings, um, which happened a few decades later. So you can see this article I found, don't even mention the 20, 220 million starlings we have now, it's the same guy. So he kind of single-handedly caused a lot of havoc ecologically in this country. So to move on to our native sparrows, um, so this is, this picture I feel kind of represents some of the difficulty with seeing sparrows. Um, and I do have to say that, you know, if I saw this bird, if I was in the field and I saw it at the distance that this picture is sort of portraying, I wouldn't magically know what that bird was. Um, so when we talk about really seeing the beautiful characteristics and ornate markings on sparrows, we are definitely talking about using binoculars to do so, um, or, you know, a, a high powered camera or something like that. So let's move in a little bit closer to this bird. Ah, okay. Now I can see it. Now I can see a lot of its distinctive markings. Um, and so we're going to get even closer to that bird. This is a LeConte sparrow, and we're going to revisit this picture later. So I wanted, when I was thinking about this particular webinar, I wanted to um, sort of organize it in a way that would kind of make sense. And and what I what I decided on was looking mainly at habitat for our breeding species that breed here in Missouri and then um, also for our wintering birds and I'll show you some migrants as well. So we have about 20 species of sparrow that regularly occur in Missouri and we're going to take just a brief look at all of those. Um, so before I get started with sparrows of the prairie we have a poll for you. Do you spend time watching birds in prairies? 
What do we have? Oh. Okay. Often, occasionally, rarely, and never. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody, for answering that. It seems like most folks do get out there in the prairie at least sometimes. So here are three of our um, prairie or grassland um, breeding sparrows. So we have a Henslow sparrow right here. And you can start to see when you really look at these, and again, I'm not trying to get everybody on this call to be able to, you know, know the ID of these birds. Um, I'm just sort of thinking we can all just check them out and appreciate all of their different, their different marking and patterns and colors. Um, the subtle yellows and rusty colors on this Hensel Sparrow and the little streaks. We have a grasshopper sparrow here. And I believe Ethan's gonna get a little bit into their, their sounds that they make, which are really, really interesting. And then we have the lark sparrow, which is sort of more of an old field, um, sort of farmstead species, not necessarily a, a you know, purely native prairie species. Um, but this is a really neat bird with a really neat song as well. They actually all have very, very interesting songs and folks often find them easier to identify by song because, you know, from a distance, with, say without binoculars particularly, they can look pretty similar, but their songs are all very, very distinctive. So I wanted to call this sparrows of the borderlands. Um, so by which I mean sort of the interface area between prairies, sort of more forest edge, um, shrub um, dwelling and nesting species. So we have our field sparrow. Um, I think this bird is particularly cute with its pink beak and his, his eye ring. Chipping sparrow. Um, and again, these are birds that breed here. A chipping sparrow is a bird that you can often find in your backyards. And the reason they're called chipping sparrows is they have a song that essentially is of a, a series of, of chips that sound like a trill. So these handsome examples here, the male and female Eastern Tohi. Um, this is a bird that surprises a lot of people when they find out that it is a sparrow and it's a pretty big sparrow. Um, Tohis are a little smaller than cardinals. So big, big for a sparrow and obviously very, very strikingly colored. And this sparrow, um, that little spot in the center of song sparrow's chest amidst all of those streaks um, is, is just a very defining characteristic. What's kind of interesting about song sparrows in that spot is that since it's made up of a conglomerate of streaks, um, actually the closer you are to the bird and the more um, clearly you see it, the less distinct that spot becomes. So it's actually like the farther you are away from the bird, the more easily you can see that spot. Um, and as the bird's name implies, this sparrow is a very beautiful song. So this is a species that I'm not personally very familiar with. This is the Backman sparrow. Oops, I, Paige is, is making comment, making gestures at me kind of, I forgot a poll. I should have done it right before the slide. So if you would go ahead, I, we wanted to see how many of you have seen those birds of the borderlands anywhere, seen or heard them. So the field sparrow, the chipping sparrow, Eastern towhee and song sparrow. I think, folks, that you should be able to choose more than one. You should be able to tell us if you've seen all of them or two or three or none or one. All right. Oh, good deal. Wow. That's great. I'm really glad. So a majority of folks have, have seen all of them, really, but a, a very high percentage have seen the chipping sparrow field and song, and less so the Eastern Tohi. Wonderful. Okay, so the species that is really our most specifically forest dwelling sparrow in the state of Missouri is the Backman sparrow. Um, MRBO doesn't work in the Ozarks terribly much. Um, it is my understanding that this bird is quite rare. It is a species of concern. 
Um, and you can see its breeding range down there in southern Missouri. Here are a few species that mainly migrate through, um, although there's evidence certainly of Lincoln Sparrow and Savannah Sparrow wintering here as well. Um, but if you look at range maps, these are largely considered passage migrants, so birds that simply migrate through our state. Um, you can see we have, other than the clay-colored sparrow, we have a lot of streaks going on here, right? Um, let's look at him first. The clay collar sparrow, um, one of the most distinctive things about this bird is that gray collar um, around, around the bird's neck. Lincoln sparrow, um, which <laughs> in my personal opinion is probably the cutest sparrow. Um, they just, they're, they're really, um, they can act very tame. Um, we've had them singing 10 feet from our, our back porch before. Uh, wall on migration. Um, and I just think that this is a really beautiful bird as well. Savannah sparrow. Um, you can see here that this bird is perched on a barbed wire fence. Um, so this is another open country, you know, prairie, old field, um, farmstead dwelling uh, migrant. And then the Nelson sparrow. Um, my understanding is that this species and Leconte sparrow are both throughout their range, not a terribly, terribly common bird. Um, and you can see sort of have that glow. And if you see them in, in very bright sunlight, particularly, it's like they're glowing golden. Okay, so sparrows of the winters. Now, some of these, I've, I've, I've separated this into um, in your backyard and probably not in your backyard, but I do have to add the caveat that that is largely from my own personal experience and from talking to other Missourians. Um, so you might see birds on this slide that are never in your backyard and maybe on the next slide you'll say, hey, you know, those are definitely, um, definitely in my backyard. So we have the white crowned sparrow named for very obvious reasons. Um, the bird on the right hand side is a first winter bird, so it hasn't become, it hasn't gotten into its full adult plumage yet. Um, and something to note um, is that there's very little, in sparrows in general, there's, there's very little difference between male and female um, in their colorations, with the exception of the eastern towhee that we saw earlier. Um, so in this case and in a couple of the next ones, it's, it's not differences between male and female. The fox sparrow, um, I believe named for its reddish plumage, this is very much the color of a fox. This is another big sparrow. It's not quite as big as the tohi, but this is still a, this is otherwise the biggest sparrow that we have. This is gonna be a pretty familiar one to folks. Um, they're often known as snowbirds. Uh, this is the dark-eyed junco. So we have um, mostly the subspecies slate colored um, that you see there on the left and on the upper right. Um, but then sometimes, um, and not terribly uncommonly, we see the Oregon form of the dark-eyed junco uh, here in Missouri. The white-throated sparrow, another very common visitor to feeders. Um, I put two pictures of the white striped form. So you can see that basically refers to the um, area above the eye. And you can see sometimes, which I thought this is kind of interesting, in the picture on the bottom there, the white of the throat is, is sometimes bordered by a black line. And you can see that on the tan stripe, but not always. <laughs> okay, so... I think we have one more poll for you all. Yeah, and I, we wanted to see, have you seen all these species in your backyard? I have to say that we don't get fox sparrows um, in my yard. That's something that I've heard about.
All right. Lots of slate colored juncos. Almost, almost everybody. Okay, yeah, Oregon Junko, not, not terribly common, but about a quarter of the people. But they're out. So your backyards are very much like my backyard. We occasionally do get Oregon Juncos, not, not terribly often. And I still am hoping for the fox bear to show up. So, okay. I, we might get some arguments on this one, um, but probably not in your backyard. So um, Swamp Sparrow is aptly named. And again, we're just gonna look at these guys a little bit closer. Um, Leconte Sparrow is a prairie, very much an open native prairie species. Um, the two on the bottom, um, I have heard from a few people that they get American tree sparrows in their yard. I don't hear that very often. And then Harris's sparrow, um, there on the bottom right, um, we do get those very, very, very occasionally um, in our yard uh, here outside of Marshall. But it's not every year, and it's just usually. Um, the one we had this year actually was um, in breeding plumage, which is not what you're seeing there on the bottom right. It's a little bit different. Um, the bird's face gets grayer, for instance, and the, the black becomes more prominent. Um, but we had that bird here in, I think it was May 10th this year, which I thought was, was pretty amazing. Um, but a little closer look. So the swamp sparrow, um, a little streaky guy, very aptly named, um, lives in, in wetland areas. I, I don't hear about them much in backyards, but this is a pretty darn common bird. Um, we see this bird in the winter and, and on migration as well, coming through Missouri. The beautiful glowing Leconte Sparrow. Um, so I saw a lot of range maps that only showed this bird migrating through um, winter here, not in huge numbers, but certainly in, in regular, um, they're, they're regular about doing so. The little tree sparrow with that little spot on his chest. This is a very regular winter um, species here in Missouri. And they're kind of, I consider them more of a borderlands inhabiting type species as well. Um, they are found in fields um, in large numbers. And so, and I don't know that their name is the most apt name. Um, they have, they seem to have more of an affinity for fields and shrubs um, than living in a forest. And finally, the Harris's sparrow. So this particular species um, was the last bird in North America to have its nest found um, by, by biologists, by researchers, because it nests on the high Arctic tundra. Um, so this is a very long distance migrating, migrating species. So with that, I'm gonna end on that handsome bird and hand it over to a handsome guy to talk about Sparrow Sounds. Let's see, stop share, and there you go. Mr. Ethan. Hey everybody, I'll start sharing my screen here. So that was a pretty interesting look at what some of these sparrows look like. Um, I know that some of you are uh, really good birders and some of you are just sort of beginning getting into birding. Um, I would like to introduce you to a really interesting component to, um, I just want to, I look at, let you hear some of these sounds. You can hear those high tink, 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 tink call notes. Those really high call notes, those pink, there's the whole world of them. And especially within sparrows. Um, so when visual ID can get really challenging, it really helps to be able to listen to birds. All these sparrows have really distinct songs. Um, and, and most of those songs can be complex and, and uh, very distinguishable. They also have a lot of different call, what we call call notes or single note sounds that they, they make. And typically those are classified as calls. 
And um, I'm hoping that uh, those who want to get become better birders will learn from this sort of lexicon and, and see this huge world of, of calls out there. Um, so this was a sound spectrogram here, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and by the way, that was the wonderful swamp sparrow making those little call notes. Um, I just want to do a little plug real quick for our Mo Missouri Birdsong website, which is mobirdsong.org. And we're building a collection of bird songs and recordings of bird sounds focused on Missouri. You can learn more at that website. Also, if you want to learn more about this acoustic stuff I'm going to talk about, we have a webinar in our archive on our YouTube page. And uh, you can find it on YouTube, Missouri River Bird Observatory. And you can check out all of our past webinars as well as that one on acoustics. So... Without further ado, I'll get into this, but I want to give a big plug to Nathan Peoples and his book, uh, Peterson's Field Guide to Bird Sounds of Eastern, Eastern North America. This book has been absolutely wonderful for me to help classify sounds and be able to try to interpret and explain it to other people. And uh, the, the book has an index on things like single note calls or complex sounds, things like that. There's an introduction in that YouTube video I showed you about earlier. So um, the, the, the terminology I use is derived from this book because it's the only one I could find that had something like that that was really well classified for everybody to be able to understand sounds better. Um, just to give you a quick uh, introduction to sound spectrograms, you'll be seeing these. There on the left axis there, you see um, kilohertz. So that's frequency, high pitch, low pitch. Um, and then the bottom axis is, will always be on, on my sound spectrograms uh, seconds. Sometimes they're small down to a half second. Um, to see and hear what a sound looks like, here's an example with an American Robin. Oh, by the way, loudness is another thing. Amplitude, it's almost three-dimensional. So if they're really bright, the brighter they are, the louder they are. So different parts of their notes may be louder. But uh, here's an American Robin caroling. Pretty wonderful. Um, so, so there's Nathan Peoples' book, just to re reiterate that. Um, but here's the single note sounds, a few single note sounds. So these are classifications within single note sounds. So here's a few of them right here. Now within each of these categories, from a click tap or snap, a chip-like note, a peep or chirp-like note, a high seat-like note, there are many notes within those and there's whistles and there's low pitch notes a lot of the saw the sparrow single notes fall within a few categories but look at all of these categories of single notes that you can just dive into but like i said we're just going to go into sparrows a little bit right now and let's start out with just a few of these categories of chip like notes and so just roughly there's a there's a, a classic chip like note there's a peep or a chirp-like note right there. And don't worry, you'll get a chance to hear these. And a high seat note right there. Good example of a high seat note. So chip-like notes, sounds of sparrows. So chip note is something that is sharply down slurred. You can think of that as a line slightly going down to the right. That's down slurred. There's a chip note. You just heard a chip note. Now imagine walking through a prairie or someplace and you hear that. A lot of good birders know that chip note and they can tell you what it is with a few other sparrows dinging around making chip notes as well or sounds that are similar to that they're smacks you know i think of nelson sparrows make a smack there's little tinks high musical really high frequency little tinks and we're going to get into these pink there's a pink there's a pisip very high up and down there's a tsip there's a two all these different things so let's look at some examples of these and look at the chip. And I'm using a swamp sparrow example because that's the one we heard first. And it's a great example of a chip, but here's all our other sparrows that do this chip. So if you're out there and you hear a chip, it might not necessarily key it down to one species. You have to look for a distinct call for each species. But if you hear that, you can pretty much put it in the category of at least these sparrows. Also, uh, Thanks for the feedback page. It looks like the audio is working pretty good. Good. Um, smack. 
sparrows that smack and i really wanted to find a good nelson sparrow because i think they have one of the most wonderful smacks out there but um dark eyed junko also is an underrated smacker you know is way overlooked um so uh, isn't that remarkably different that's a real good smack and there's tinks sparrows that tink there's a lot of them, including our towhees. So if you hear a tink, well, you're just gonna have to do a little bit more digging around. But um, here's a tink. <laughs> okay, here's some pinks. Pinks are really cool. Look at that tail that goes up. So it starts out with this and then it comes down. And so, Pinks are really neat, and, and um, I'll just uh, play it so you can hear it. Can you hear that almost musical quality to it? It almost sounds like something's being tunked a little bit. It's a pink. So it's really hard because they're, they're, they're so compressed over time. So I've done a little trick here and I've slowed this down to about 0.15 seconds. So you can really hear the pink and you can really see that these are distinctive and birders out in the field oftentimes miraculously are able to hear this. almost sounds like something getting tunked, you know? It's really neat. So um, the psip notes, sparrows that psip, lark sparrow. So if you hear a psip, it's likely, and you know it's a sparrow, it's likely our lark sparrow. Oh, they often double them up like that, those specific notes. It's really nice. Uh, as you notice, the, all these, re that was a nice recording. All these recordings are listed up on top. Um, they come from Zeno Canto, a great website for accessing bird sounds. Here's a tsit, sparrows that sit. It's almost like a click, you know, it's almost, but it, it is a little more musical than that. So here's that sit, and this is what field sparrows often do. And if you spend a lot of time in the prairie, you'll, you'll hear this quite a bit. You're gonna be hearing grasshopper sparrows, hensel sparrows, and field sparrows mostly. And if you get really tuned in, you'll find that their cadence and their qualities of calls make them easily distinguishable for the most part. Yeah. Really comes down really fast, like pretty neat. So then is it Tsu? So you guys are lucky. I'm just gonna throw you through one category of the single notes. We're almost through this one. This is the uh uh American tree sparrow, and, and look how that really I mean it's so subtle, but that is actually going downward from left to right. They're just amazing. They're they're very subtle yet they're very distinctive. And it's amazing how s the calls become similar. It seems like the more closely related some of these bird species are. Super. So in the category of chirp-like notes, there's only one bird that we have, one sparrow, that actually fits in that category. And that's the one we spoke of earlier. And interestingly enough, it actually puts its chirp actually in its song, not purely as like a regular call out there, alarm call or a contact call. Um, it's actually part of its song. So everybody knows the sound of the Walmart special.
it's it's something you can think about that it's the sound of um everywhere in small town america and and it's really cool because you can be in europe or uh, any place around the world it seems and this will be the sound of the streets this will be one sound with all the bustle of people this is something that pretty much everybody could relate to um, and uh, it's universally known and also knowing that so well you can use that as a basis of comparison to other sorts of call notes so um, here is a list of high seat light sounds and here's a very good example of one that, let's see So that was an example of a seat, a not bury seat. There's also bury seats. But this is something we hear, if you know cedar waxwings, think of it as shortened versions of what cedar waxwings do. Very high frequency um, with a lot of variation to them. They can be up slurred and down slurred, under slurred. You can think of an under slur as sort of a, a U and an over slur as an upside down U and a sound spectrogram. Goes down, then up, and then down. Um, short, buzzy, little high frequency things as well. And uh, of course, that burry, burry seat, uh, that's, it's almost sounds musical, not musical, musical. It's almost like trills. It's like a compressed trill. So I'll just go into a couple, uh, a good example of uh, one of these high frequency um, sounds. And I'll give you a good example of a sip. And this actually is a double note. And this is from our grasshopper sparrow. Hear that little double note in there. You can also hear a chainsaw in the background. So that was a great deep dive into the fascinating world and black hole of, of sparrow calls um, and, and calls in general. And I hope that helps you uh, advance and understand it and have more appreciation for our sparrows. Um, as a practical comparison, I'll show you how that can be useful once you start learning this. And it really helps to spend time in the field. But um, if you have a chance to record birds, there's ways that you can make your own sound spectrogram uh, uh, for free, basically. So um, I'll give you an example of, let's compare these two, these two sounds. This one here. And then we look in the, this one here. Give that chance, I'll give it a chance, I'll that. But you can see how distinctively different they are. You can hear how distinctively different they are. We could have done a poll on this, but you can see that one was our lovely Henslow Sparrow. And the other one was our lovely grasshopper sparrow. So even if you couldn't see these birds, you would be able to ID them. So uh, I guess that, that wraps it up for all of us. And uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed that. Um, and we're ready to open it up for questions from the field sparrows. Awesome. Yeah. So if any of you have any questions, feel for free to put them in that Q&A um, button, box, whatever you want to call it, um, about anything, about sparrows. Um, and yeah, if, if you don't have a question about sparrows in particular, but there's something you've been wondering about birds lately, feel free to put that in there too. I think um, that I think it's really cool, like, so about the, like, all the little, like, chip calls that sparrows make, I think it's super fascinating how there's so many different types. Can I, can I personal, am I personally good at identifying them in the field? No, I am not. <laughs> but I still think it's really cool, and it's something that I strive to learn how to do because I've seen people do it. So if you're sitting there going, what? <laughs> 
you people can learn how to do it and i think that's super cool and who knew pink was a sound and not just a color or a band so i think that's fun <laughs> so okay it looks like we have some questions coming in okay so um so someone wants to hear the henslows and grasshoppers songs again so i don't think ethan played their their um their calls but not their songs um but are you able to do that ethan or <laughs> what what would you like to play their calls again is that it the henslows and grasshoppers yeah i can play their calls no problem <laughs> let's see let me go back to that slide right there those two together okay this will be the henslow sparrow I can't hear it. Yeah. Hear that? Very high pitched. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Let me make sure um, it's sharing my uh, audio. Same as system, select microphone, same as system. Let's see if this works. Is that better? I don't hear it. Dana, do you hear it? Here, I'm going to have to share my screen to make it work. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry guys. About no worries. <laughs> you can do it. Let me share this uh, screen. There we go. Now, tell me. Yep. Great. There's our, there's our Henslows. Here's our grasshoppers. Now it's, it's really important to share with you that understanding these calls and listening to these calls is very much like birding by visually birding and that there, there can be individual variation within them or within a call type, there might be a minor bit of plasticity, um, but they should be distinctive enough to at least put them in a category, but there may be subtle variations within them. Um, just as there would be with plumage or anything like that. Um, not quite as drastic as that, but there is. And also, um, there are more than one call type for a particular uh, species. So, for instance, if I look at a Henslow sparrow, during night flight calls or migration, you might hear a seat or a sue a lot. But typically during breeding season, you're going to hear tinks and to sits. So it won't always be one unique uh, type of call. And, and so I hope, hope that uh, you could hear that okay. And I know that high frequencies can be often difficult to hear as we get older. Um, and for some people, it's low frequencies that are difficult. Yeah, great. So um, another person asks, when do the migrating sparrows typically come through this area? I think that's a good question for Dana. <laughs> Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So now here in, in June, they'll, they'll be where they're going already. Um, so they can start really coming as early as like late March. Um, so a lot of our sparrows are short distance, what we call short distance migrants. So unlike some of the species that you hear about, um, I don't know, tanagers comes to mind, or dick sissels, which is another prairie bird. Um, they migrate from, you know, South America, Northern South America. As you know, I'm sure a lot of birds winter in the, in the tropics um, in Mexico, but a lot of our sparrows um, will winter on like the Texas Gulf Coast and uh, Louisiana Gulf Coast, Gulf Coastal Plain. And so because of that, they're already a little bit closer and they therefore get here a little bit earlier than what a lot of bird watchers think of, as I think of, as peak migration time, which is typically like the first week or two of May. 
Um, so our sparrows are usually earlier than that. Um, and then sort of depending on the species, they would migrate back through any time really between mid-August and even late October. So fall migration is a lot more protracted for, for most species of birds, not just, not just our sparrows, um, because they're not the huge to get to the ground and get their degree and all that. Um, and it's kind of weird. So a little bit by species, um, but you know, early to mid spring and early to late fall. And every year it's a little bit different, right, Dana? <laughs> <laughs> True. A little, bit, a little bit. Yep. Yep. Sometimes if there's, or if, if there's a lot of south winds um, in the spring, winds coming out of the south, um, that is a tailwind for migrating birds. And so if they, if, if they catch those south winds, they can come through quickly um, and not not stop over very long and the reverse in the fall north winds will just keep them you know keep them pushing through sweet um so kathy asks about house sparrows at feeder so she says that the house sparrows seem pretty aggressive at my feeder is there anything i can do about that or just enjoy them um well that's a very positive like way to look at it too but um and you guys can all come on, comment on this too, but I think the only thing that like will work sometimes for me here is to just like not put food out for a few days. Mm -hmm. Then the house sparrows are like, Ugh, whatever. And then they like go off, do their thing. And then I'll put food out. And usually it is the native species that tend to come back and find it again first. Um, but I know Kathy's in town, so I don't know how much I don't know if that would work as well, but that's one thing you could try. <laughs> Other mm -hmm. than that, I'm not sure. <laughs> right. I, I would have the same. That's what we do as well. Go ahead, Eve. I think um, certain seeds may not be favored by them, like um, maybe uh, safflowers or something like that. Or if you have niger seed or something for uh, goldfinches, you can at least maybe feed goldfinches for a little while. Um, remember also this time of year um, and going on that the mulberries are, are, are out fruiting. So a lot of birds are, are hitting those and also birds are feeding babies, maybe insects this time of year. So you might want to uh, just don't, don't think that you're doing a bad job and you're just getting over on the sparrows and all the other birds are gone uh, because they're, they're, the natives are finding a lot of good resources out there right now, particularly if you're surrounded by good habitat like Arrow Rock. Yeah. That's a great answer too. Yeah. So types of seeds you can experiment with and um, anything like that. So cool. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, so, so juncos are sparrows is something, another comment. And yeah, so um, they don't have sparrow in the name, so it's a bit confusing, but if you look, and I know they don't have quite the same patterning as a lot of sparrows. They're not as like streaky and like that have that like very brown bottling on their back. But if you look at their overall like shape and beak shape in particular, yep, they look a lot like sparrows. But that is something that um, when I'm talking to the public, some people are surprised by too, because they think of them as like their own little category because there are all those subspecies that people are aware of too with the Oregon and the, and the slate colored. So I think it, juncos are like kind of a fun thing in that way. Does anybody else have anything to add about that? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> cool. I got it. Woo. Okay. So where is a where are the best public areas to view prairie birds? Great um, question. Great question. Um, do you, it would be, so I'm not sure where you're located at, um, but there are a lot of, like prairie conservation areas. Dana and Ethan can answer this question way better than me because they are more involved with the p field project sites that we do and some of those are public land I know mm -hmm. and I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so most of those are public um, and when I say public I'm largely talking about Missouri Department of Conservation areas so um, 
and there are many, many, some of the most, some of the largest um, and most well-managed are things like Wakanta Prairie, which is down by El Dorado Springs, Taborville Prairie, same, same area. Um, there's a number of areas down by Joplin as well. Uh, Diamond Grove Prairie is one that comes to mind. Um, the Missouri Prairie Foundation also has a lot of really, really well-managed, beautiful pieces of native, never been plowed prairie. Um, they tend to be a little bit smaller because it's a, you know, it's a private organization um, and native unplowed prairie is a very, very expensive piece of land. Um, but they're just awesome examples of both floristic diversity and, and insect diversity and bird diversity. Um, and if you go to their website, if you go to moprairie.org, um, they have a thing at the top that says where we work and it'll give you a nice map of their properties. Um, and they're kind of like all down the Western, all over the sort of central and Western part of the state of Missouri. Um, there's also up in Northern Missouri in Harrison County is the Nature Conservancy's Dunn Ranch. I'm sure a lot of folks on this call have probably heard of that. Um, that's a really cool place to go. It's, you know, it being TNC, like that's technically private. I believe you're allowed to hike there, but they do run a herd of bison. So you got to not be in the bison unit. Um, they have things like prairie chicken viewing um, in a blind and a very big area as well. Um, and then there's a lot of different smaller places. I mean, Arrow Rock has a prairie restoration going on. Van Meter has a Van Meter State Park north of Marshall has a prairie restoration going on. Um, and then there's a lot of private lands that particularly if um, people, a, a lot of folks do restoration of prairie on their, on their private land. Um, a lot of folks, if you know any cattle ranchers, a lot of times you can see a lot of our native prairie species on working cattle properties. So if yeah, you wanna, am I, I'm sure, I mean, there's tons of places, so I'm probably forgetting some. Yeah, You're so, muted. Yep, yep, I know. Um, let me do a quick screen share here. And I uh, put a link in the chat to this. If you scroll down through the story map provided by the Department of Conservation, they show public prairies of Missouri on a map. So you can zoom right into, um, and see where all these prairies are located and, and you can find one uh, near you that way. And also that has a lot of great information on prairies anyways as well. So, um, yep, you can use that. Use that in the chat box, you'll find that link. Yeah, awesome. And I believe MPF, um, Missouri Prairie Foundation was a part of that too, according to Brooke, who is on this webinar. <laughs> so just to give them a shout out too. Um, awesome, yeah, so there's, a lot there's a lot of great places in Missouri which is I think pretty cool um, because I think there is something about prairies that seems less accessible than a habitat like forests but they are out there <laughs> and just to add you know I said there were tons of places and there are and we're very lucky about that but we have less than one percent of our native prairie left so um, it's Paige, when you said they're less accessible, I totally see why you said that, but it's also, you know, people can go to the Ozarks and, and hang out in a lot of forested areas. And I think that um, prairies are particularly, you know, native prairies are just further and few, fewer and further between, basically. That's a good point. That's probably why it seems that way. <laughs> um. So, ooh, great question. So what is the difference between a call and a song? Um, so, I mean, I can kind of let Ethan go in depth about this, but I think the short answer is a song is typically longer. What? Oh, <laughs> go ahead, Ethan, go ahead. <laughs> Stay in your lane, sister. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I could go on a long explanation, but I won't. But it, a lot of times people try to put them in categories of behavior and what the function of those vocalizations are. That's been the classic way to do it. So calls are just contact and alarm and just how you doing kind of things. 
um, where uh, songs are usually defending territory or advertising for mates. But there's no hard and fast rule about that. So when, if you're really going into the ID through sound, you want to look at sound um, uh, and, and the components of sound, uh, maybe more so than um, trying to put them in a call or a song. Just, you know, is it a short sound or a long song? Is it a bunch of phrases? Is it complex? So, yeah, hope that answered that question. Yeah. And on that note, on that note, um, while we're while we're leading towards wrapping things up, because that appears to be one of the last questions, um, it was a heck of a big week. Um, last week was Black Birders Week, and um, it's something that's on everybody's mind right now. Merbo's core values include um, the equality, uh, diversity, and inclusion, and uh, it's something we really need in our field of birding. Um, I was really, my mind has opened up this week, seeing how many blackbirders are out there that are afraid to go places because of the problems that are in our society. And uh, it's all on us. You know, if we get a chance to help people out, make them feel more comfortable, it's going to be better for us. It's better to be bird watching. So, um, and there's a lot to it. Um, I've been learning a lot about it this last week. I hope you all are too, um, because it's not always so much we, there's a lot we can continue to do outside and systemically, but also it's really great to explore, you know, inside uh, looking in yourself, how maybe your, your perceptions may be uh, missing something about what, what's wrong out there um, and, and how we got to help everybody's life and the lives of birds. So I uh, just wanted to sort of wrap up with that a little bit because it is what's going on right now. I think that's a perfect wrap up. <laughs> so yeah, it appears that we don't have any more questions. And if you think of one later, feel free to email us. Um, our emails are all on the website. If you go mrbo.org and then you go contact us, all of our emails are listed there. Um, and cause we love answering bird questions. I mean, we love talking about them. Obviously we've done so many webinars <laughs> that are an hour long talking about different facts about birds. So. Um, yeah, we love to do that. And we I'll also just wrap up by saying that thank you guys for attending um, and asking your great questions. And we hope you have a greater appreciation for the sparrows um, that you can see in Missouri. <laughs>